Hello and welcome to Ian Dale All Talk. This is a podcast, it's also a video. If you'd like to watch what we're saying in the next hour, you can do so on the LBC YouTube channel or on iandale.com. Well, today we're going to meet somebody who I have been scared stiff of for many years, but also a great admirer of. She's somebody who everybody in the radio industry wants to ingratiate themselves with because she's been writing radio reviews for probably more years than she cares to remember. It is, of course, Gillian Reynolds. Now, Gillian, you, every article I read about you, you are referred to as the doyen of radio I interviews. Hate that word. Do you? I hate it. <laughs> well, you've just recently left the Sunday Times. You'd spent many years on the Telegraph before you went to the Sunday Times. Um, and I, The Guardian before that. And The Guardian before that. Are, are you feeling a bit of a void? Yes, I am. Uh, uh, I'm over the feelings of um, shock horror. I'm going to rush down and chop all their heads off towards <laughs> the Sunday Times. I'm over that. I'm quite like getting back two nights sleep a week because writing the column was really quite... Um, it's a bit more... Short is harder than long, yeah. as you know. Yeah. And... Uh, Writing that column was a lot of work uh, because uh, I l listened to a lot of radio and trying to compress everything into um, uh, that amount of words was was quite a task, but I like that and I miss that. And what would you have, 700 words, 800 words, something like that? It was, it was something like 750 and yeah. sometimes it would go a bit longer. Yeah. And... Obviously, the column appeared on a Sunday, but when did you have to file it? Oh, don't. I mean, that was the real pain in the arse, frankly. It was... Um, first of all, it was a Monday, lunchtime on a Monday, for the following Sunday. Mm. And after a bit, they let me go until lunchtime on Tuesday, which is still very early. Now, this um, illustrates one of the great dilemmas for anybody who writes about radio which is that everyone's got a terrible deadline. No one has them as bad as mine used to be. That's why we all write about the same things, because they're the only... Only the big shows are on preview. Yeah. Now, my advantage was that, because I listened to the radio all the day anyway, uh, I knew a lot of things that were in the air, you know, so I, I would listen to LBC, I would listen to Scala, I would listen to, you know, new stations that came along like Boom and listen to them for a bit and get their rhythms so that I could write a bit about the um, the knitting up of the fabric of radio as well as the star turns. But it was it was a bit challenging. Because I remember what, my, my first few years in radio, I used to obviously read all the different reviews yeah. and, of course, in those days, there were far more of them. I mean, yeah. really, you and Miranda Sawyer, the only two uh, really left. And... I used to say to my colleagues, why do they just write about Radio 4 and Radio 3? Why don't they write about... And somebody said, well, it's because they all of their programmes, generally, apart from like the Today programme or whatever, they're pre-recorded. And so they, they send them out weeks in advance, whereas, of course, commercial stations don't operate on that way. No. And so commercial stations, I think, always have a disadvantage with radio reviewers in a way. Not with me, though. Not latterly, definitely not. No, no, all the way, all the way through my career, because... I, I've worked in commercial yeah. radio. But we'll come on to that a bit later. And I knew how, you know, I know how difficult it is to work miracles on fourpence, frankly. Mm. You know, because you're up against television, you're up against the newspapers, you're up against miles of other radio stations now. And it's very hard to keep an edge, to keep originality. And that's why I, I say, you know, I always try to reflect the fabric of radio and uh, as it knits itself up week by week. Were you always, or are you aware of the impact that your words can have? Because I think if you say something mildly disobliging about a presenter in your column, I mean, that can really stick with someone for a very long time. Yes. I have reason to think um, that uh, there are people who take this very much to heart. Mm. Um, it, what can I say? You know? <laughs> But well, you can't just say lovely things all the time, I'm can you? You're I'm there to give an honest opinion. Tell the truth of your heart. Yeah. Or, as my mother would have said, tell the truth and shame the devil. But I, I, you know, would try to be honest. And if I'd got it wrong, or if I'd made an early judgment, which I later went back on, I would always say so. But that, you know, that's because um, I was 
grew up with radio. I mean, I'm yeah. 85, you know. So I was born in 1935 uh, when radio was the big thing, you know. Do you remember your grandparents' house with a, a brown radio with a big wooden front? Oh, I remember my parents' house with that. Did they have that? Oh, no, we... we I, I'm a child of the 60s, and uh, I remember... Um, in our house, it was a farmhouse, we would have this big sort of radio, I don't know, about sort of that size. And I used to love twiddling as a child, as a little child, I loved twiddling. And it was a very, I can't describe it, but it was it was a knob that you twiddled, but it, it had a bit of resistance. And, yes. and I used to love seeing the dial go across. Go across, yeah. And, which, of yeah. course, you don't really get nowadays, no. do you? I mean, the, no. A radio has all, just an... Even nowadays, I think the design of radios is actually really interesting, and it's, it's digital radios have gone completely retro. I have just written a piece for um, this weekend's I newspaper, and I could write about anything I wanted, and I thought about a lot of things, and then I thought, oh, no, I'll write about the radio. And, you know, the, the shape of radios is, is very instructive. I mean, there's at least... Probably you're the same. There's at least one radio in every room in my mm. flat. And in the kitchen, there are three. And there's um, a tiny little um, Sony you can hold in your hand. And that's always on medium wave, because I quite like the crackle. <laughs> you know? it's, Five Live doesn't sound quite right now, does it? it? On digital, you it sort doesn't. of expect a bit of fading. A bit of crackle, <laughs> yeah. And um, there's, I've got one of those big um, Trevor Bayliss wind-up radios. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, which is you know, a bit of curiosity, but it works. And then I've got uh, a very modern um, digital radio, which was given to me by um, uh, the people at the Sunday Times by News Corp. And that is a Roberts, but it's like a little square box. It's the colour yeah. of, of this blue and it's got gold lettering. And this, I'm, I'm not making this up, it's got a little raised gold News Corp low garnish, just be above its golden grill. And the other week, after I'd been ejected from the bosom of the, of the company, I went to touch it, and I didn't have my glasses on. I pushed the wrong bit, and I pushed the logo, and the end fell off. I thought, this is a sign. Serendipity. This is a sign. <laughs> it is separating itself Do they, from did they not give a reason for letting you go? No. Nor did the editor ring me. I mean, that's the thing that really makes me cross. I think it's unmannerly. Mm. Uh, not that I'd ever met her, but, you know, uh, she was my third editor in three years and 10 mo 20 months. Well, she's certainly made a lot of changes, hasn't she? Well, she, I think she's having to make a lot of changes. Mm. Uh, I don't know what they are because the chain of command there is bizarre. Uh, <clears throat> you know, nobody... I wasn't appointed by the woman I was responsible to. Yeah. who's also had the bullet, by the way. The woman who edits the culture section was ordered to ring me, and then two weeks later, uh, they terminated her as well. But um, decisions are taken right at the top, but then handed down through this bizarre chain of command, eventually reaching you. And no reason, just changes. But in a way, that is the media industry, isn't it? Is it's it? the radio. Well, it's the radio industry as well, because we know as presenters that at some point we're going to be replaced. That's just the way it is, and you, you have to accept it. And I think the way you handle that situation, um, but I think particularly for presenters, I mean, you, you will know over the years presenters who've thrown their toys out of the pram, but it never does, it never does them any good, I, I never no, think. No, it doesn't. And I've always said, when, when it comes to my turn, if I ever show any signs of tantrums, somebody is to tap me on the shoulder and say, remember what you used to say, you'd always leave with your head held high. But do you do good tantrum? I do terribly good tantrums. I know I know. I come across with this sort of nice, smooth voice, but... Oh, oh I no, you don't. I can throw a tantrum. At, in fact, I did last night on the, <laughs> when I was talking I about vaccines. I uh, Yeah, my Twitter feed is a bit of a sewer today as a result I heard you. I tried to get through last night. Oh, did you? Yes. I wanted to say to you, uh, when you were talking about people being reluctant to uh, go out and, and, and have their inoculations. I will not say jab. Jab <laughs> suggests to me murderers and assassins in the night. So I want you to get through and say, are you taking into account people who've grown accustomed to staying in? And uh, or I'm, you know, being old, I'm a, and judged feeble. They keep telling me, you know, 
you're at great risk. Who, me? I'll take that name on. <laughs> and uh, still the inhibition about crossing the doorstep is with you. Oh. So, I mean, I've, I went and had my two inoculations, my vaccinations, but uh, I, I know people who didn't because they're scared of going out. And, and that's fine. I mean, that That is, in a way, a reason I can respect. What I can't respect is anybody who th who says they're not going to have one because they know better. Well, you don't know better, actually. The scientists know better than, than, than I don't mean you, I mean you generally. And I, I have little patience for people like that. And generally, I will, as you know, I know you, you've listened a lot. I, even if I disagree with someone, I will take on board their argument and have it out with them in a sort of reasonably yeah. calm way. But there are occasions, I think, when you do feel passionately about something. And you, and I think sometimes, if, if you are a so-called shock jock and you do this every programme, you rant and rave about something, mm. it just becomes a bit tired. And we all know people that have done that over the years. Well, I think if, say, once every couple of weeks or a month, you really get aerated about something. People sit up and take notice and they, oh, what's mm. got into him? Mm. Why, is, why does he feel so strongly about this? Mm. It's sort of light and shade in a way, isn't it? And that, that's, I think, what Successful Radio is all about. I think so. And uh, it's also a feeling of uh, a personal connection to whoever is on it, mm. whether it's you or Ken Bruce or whoever, you know, feeling that um, they are your friend. Um, yeah. That's the essential magic of radio. It's very close, closer than television. Which we've certainly found out in the last... I mean, if we didn't know it before, we found out in the last year. Oh, yes. And I, I think I did about, I don't know, 130, 140 programmes from my bedroom. Yeah. It doesn't get much more intimate than that, does it? Yeah. Uh, and some friends of mine said, I, I can... You have changed. And, of course, I don't notice if I've changed, mm. but they said you've changed because you've become much more intimate. And I thought, well, it can only be because of the circumstances yeah. and the kind of conversations that you have with people, which... Yes. I mean, can be, well, incredibly moving. Oh, yes, and and unexpectedly profound. I mean, you can be talking to someone yeah. about something quite um, ordinary, you know, like bus stops or whatever, and suddenly they will say something, and the whole conversation enters a different dimension. Mm. And you don't get that on television. No, you really don't. And you know on television, I mean, people laugh when I say this, but I don't enjoy television. I would happily never do it again. Um, and it is for that reason that you know that you've probably got 30 seconds to speak without the mm. presenter interrupting you. Now, that can be the same on the radio on some occasions, but generally you, you don't have the time to make a point, to develop an argument. Um, and I, if I never appeared on any of these panel shows again, I'd be quite happy. I once <laughs> did a television... I've done a lot of television mm. in my life. Um, it was... It was where I made the money to buy my flat, you know, was doing television. And one show I did was up at Tyne Tees. And uh, it was the first of those programmes that had an audience and then uh, it ran for 90 minutes, 10.30 till midnight. And you'd see um, the cameramen all getting gleeful as it got up to midnight because they're on double time after midnight. And don't overrun and be the heated argument going on. But it was quite difficult because um, uh, you would get the phone calls in and because I'd, I'd done radio phone-ins, you know, um, and I'd, I understood the, 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 how, the how to listen, which is actually mm. quite an art. You can't just c catch one word. You've got to listen to the voice and the tone and everything. So, uh, but it was all in Geordie. And you're like, what, 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 what? <laughs> Oh, you know. Chris Kelly was my co-presenter. We'd exchanged on the first time this happened, a live show. We'd had no pilot or anything. We'd replaced somebody who'd pulled out, so they got too cheap back there <laughs> to replace him. And it was bizarre because neither of us could understand what we did in the end. We got used to it. We got used to the tune so we could understand the words. But the great thing about speech radio is that interaction isn't it oh yeah and, and okay i suppose lbc you get more of that than any other station because it is predominantly ju just phone-ins um and i always think on other forms of speech radio it's, it's much more difficult to actually understand the audience in that we kind of know who our audience are hmm. um 
And if you're on, say, Radio 4, where you've got this smorgasbord of different types of programme, and any answers really is the only phone-in programme, I think. And, and that, I always think, is just a, a bit of a token effort in that it, it, it's not as long as it needs to be if you, if you want to do a proper response to what's happened on any questions the night before. Um, but that's the only interaction that there is, apart from feedback, which I, I'm really addicted to feedback because I think it's such a hilarious programme in, in many ways and so Radio 4. But, uh, that, you do that... notice the change. I mean, it, it's had a new producer over the last year and they've made a few changes. I, I have noticed the changes, which I don't like. But then Radio... Radio listeners are very conservative beasts, aren't they? They hate change. Yes. It's like if you change a presenter, there's there's up. I, mean, I remember when I replaced James Whale on Drive on LBC, there was an uproar. Didn't last for that long, but I mean, depends how long the presenter's because been there. Of that feeling of personal exactly. ownership, and people what feel have you betrayed. Done with my show? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you run away with it. Yeah. And it doesn't Bring matter it what the radio station is. That will always be the case. I, do you know, I've been listening... I still listen to James Well on talk radio sometimes. Uh, if, if I'm, do you? If, he's up against me. How dare you? Well, <laughs> he's on later than you as no, well. No, he's not. Is he? Yes. No, he's, he's on, on the, the, he's on no, the same done, time as me. Uh, is he? Yeah, I think seven till ten. I think there's a little... So I should not be advertising him, should I, really? But hey, well, anyway, I have a lot of time for him. He's I've, a good I've, friend. Uh, I've listened to him since he was on uh, Metro. Metro Metro 261 up in Newcastle and um, followed his career with interest, uh, including the bit where he became a television star yes. on Yorkshire television yeah. and watched with horror um, how uh, this, you know, perky person was turning into a truly shocking person. Let you know my feelings in no <laughs> uncertain way. But we're still friends. But James is one of these real characters, and radio needs characters. You listen to some... I mean, music radio, which I do listen to, sometimes you just think it is so bland because the presenters are so hemmed in. They're not, they're Craig not Charles on Six Music on oh, a Saturday actually, I night. I can't listen to him. You can't I listen can't, to him? No, I can't. Well, in fact, I hardly do you listen. like the music? I don't like Six Music, generally, but um, oh, I'm, more, I'm more sort of smooth. This is funk and soul. Yeah, no, it's not, oh, not my I'm sort of thing. Girl. But I, I have listened to him when he stood in for Steve Wright, and I don't know, there's just something... He doesn't connect with me in the way that Steve Wright does. OK. Now, now there, if you were drawing up your top ten presenters of the last 30 Isn't years... He, he would have to be in yeah. the top three, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yes, he's, he's quite something. I mean, I, he was my favourite guy on Radio 1. When, when I was a Radio 1 listener in the sort of... Early, well, most of the 70s, or late 70s, early 80s, he was the one that I just thought, you are amazing. And these voices that uh, yes. he, he would have on the programme, Sid the manager and what was it? Mr Angry from Purley. And my producer said in my ear, this was about 18 months ago, just before my book came out, he said, mate, Steve Wright's just rung in. I said, no, he hasn't. He said, no, he wants to talk to you after the programme. I was thinking, this guy is my hero. So, of course, as soon as I came off air, I phoned him. And we talked for nearly an hour. Did you? And it was as if he had been my best friend for the last 30 years. I've never had that before, where I've just immediately struck up a rapport with somebody. And he, he, he wanted me to go on the programme to talk about yeah. my book, which is fantastic. And, yeah, what a, what a great presenter. Well, you're too young to remember Kenny Everett. No, of course I'm not. How, how old do you think I am? <laughs> About the same age as my oldest son, so uh, you might just remember him. <laughs> I, d I definitely remember Kenny Everett. I remember him. My main memory of him was from the 1983 general election. Do you remember when he oh, God, yes. went on that stage at Wembley? And I was supposed to be there. Career. Yeah, he did. I was supposed to be there, but I didn't go. And he was sort of saying, "Let's kick Michael Foot's walking stick away." Sort of huge roars from the audience. Um, but uh, what a character! Yes, yes, he was. He was such an original, uh, but traced his own uh, radio uh, birth to listening to Jack Jackson and on uh, the old light programme on a Saturday night and going away and trying to reproduce it in his bedroom. And he was clearly a fan of um, the fantasy world that can just build itself mm. in your mind like yeah. the magic forest, listening to the wireless. Which, in a way, James Well is a little bit like that, Yes, he is he? a bit, yeah. And... Uh, 
And I think James's real ability was to switch from one moment being Mr Angry <laughs> to then having a caller on who was telling him about the depression or something terrible in their life and completely empathising with them. And I think that's, that's, that's a real talent to be able to do that. Well, why do you think radio has survived in a way that maybe some other forms of media haven't? I, I mean, it's, we don't want to go into the lazy buggles headline. As, um, <laughs> uh, but, I mean, radio hasn't just survived, it's thriving. Absolutely. It's because, um, I think, uh, everyone underestimated its power. Um, and if you remember the um, when commercial radio first came, people got it disastrously wrong in many ways because they were trying too hard to make it like something it wasn't. They were trying to make it declarative or dramatic or whatever, instead of letting the people who present it, you know, ma mm. ma make the connection with the audience. And it, it was so strange be because how many owners did LBC go through before it ended oh, up? Oh, huge Huge numbers. number. Yeah. Uh, Capital was, you know, they were sending the pictures. I think Global must be the longest serving owner of LBC so far, I would yeah. have thought. Oh, yes, without doubt. Yeah. Without doubt. But then the whole nature of commercial radio has changed. I mean, there are two big dominant groups with a third trying to join in. And... Um, when it started, they were all local stations, you know, and LBC was set up in deliberate opposition to capital. Mm. Now you're both in the same group. But to go back to your question, I think it is the power of the human voice. I think, really think it is something about knowing that there is a person there who is speaking to you or can appear to speak to you. And you can trace this right from the very beginnings through every kind of program, through J.B. Priestley's wartime programs, uh, which Churchill was jealous of because mm. they had such an instant audience. Uh, the Yorkshire accent, you know, the gritty voice, the little boats. And Wilfred Pickles, uh, Jack Jackson, every kind of radio is where the personality of the presenter isn't imposed on you, it develops its own relationship with the audience. And I think that's the secret. And you can't beat it. Um, and it's cheap anyway. It's ch much cheaper to do than television. Well, it's cheaper nowadays, isn't it? Because yeah. literally anyone can set up a radio station on the internet. They might not have an audience, but yeah. hey, why, why not? And you look at... You, you mentioned the, the big radio groups, which have gobbled up a lot of the local commercial stations, or in fact virtually all of them now. But you now look at community radio, which is really experiencing a renaissance. And, and all the, well. well, but there are all these new stations that are starting, and they are going to be ultra-local radio, fulfilling actually a lot of what the pre... I mean, Radio Broadland, which is what, what I used to listen to when I was at university in Norfolk, um, fantastic presenters, which then was brought up by... Uh, was it GCAP at the time? It became a heart station. Yeah. And over the year, and now it is part of the heart network. Mm. But virtually all semblance of local, localness has, has gone, and this has happened all over the country. And that, so the, I think, is the loss. Well, I, I, th I think it is, but you've got the opportunity now for all of these uh, localised DAB uh, networks to actually start new radio stations But they're never going to give you news. Well, you know, the, the very good thing about commercial radio when it began was it was the news on it was um, uh, locally produced big newsrooms. Uh, Piccadilly in Manchester had a newsroom, I think, of 19. When we started in Liverpool, our managing director said, we're, oh, we're going to be bigger than Manchester, we're going to be bigger <laughs> than Piccadilly. So I think we had 22 in our newsroom. And so many of them went on to great things. I mean, um, you know, you look around television news now and all my little guys are still there. Um, uh, twinkling away but as the stations merged the newsrooms went it got smaller and smaller and smaller uh, and one of the great things about LBC is you do get local news and you get local news in a very different way and I really appreciate that because um, yes there's BBC Radio London but it doesn't have the old grit it doesn't have the feeling of what's happening at your bus stop, Mrs. Reynolds. Oh, and who would you like to complain about it? Well, of course, that's where LBC has changed, isn't it, over the last six years since, yeah. since we went national. And um, 
that was quite a difficult transition in many ways yes. because you thought, well, uh, why are we covering a tube strike now? How is this of interest to someone in Newcastle? And so I think over time we, we have gradually gone away from that sort yeah. of thing. Um, and it, it is all about balance because you, you have to cater for the audience that you have. And yes. I've always been, even when we were just London-based, I mean, we still used to have listeners all over the country, but it was generally on the internet or some weird way of listening. Mm. Um I, think, I mean, if I had a call... In, when I first started in 2010, if I got a call from Huddersfield, I'd be really excited because mm-hmm. <laughs> it was very different. And then it started, you'd get a call from Greece. Yeah. I can remember when the Greek financial crisis yeah. happened. I jokingly said, well, if anybody's listening in Greece, give us a call. Three people then did immediately. And you can do that. Any any area of the world that you're talking about now, you've got listeners there, even though you, you have no clue about who they are or, or how many of them there are. are you, do you still have to use delay? Yeah, we have a seven-second delay. Seven-second, yeah. Yeah. Yes, because um, uh, when we went on air at Radio City in Liverpool, uh, which I was part of the founding team, uh, I I did my uh, 20 months before the mast there, and I learned so much. And I learned uh, that you actually do need the seven-second delay because we were doing a phone-in without it because that bit hadn't arrived from the engineering stores. And um, the guy who did it regularly it was off his childhood measles or something. So I was sitting in for him and I next caller and out came a mouthful of sweats. <laughs> and I just froze for a second, <laughs> next caller. <laughs> well, of course, it it is a good thing to have the delay, but sometimes the... Cause Behind this glass in my studio, I have the tech op, I have the producer and the person who answers the phones. And I can remember, I better not say exactly what was said, even though this is a podcast, so I could, but it's a pretty horrible thing. We were talking about prostitution and some a woman, it was actually a guest who said it, not a caller. Ooh. And she came out with this word and it was like time stood still for a moment. And I looked at my producer, she was talking to the tech op, I looked at the um, person answering the phones, they were answering a phone, and I was thinking, have they dumped that? Because I, I, can, I can dump yeah. it as well. So I pressed the dump button, but, the, but it was too late. And in the break, I said, did you get that? And they said, get what? <laughs> and I said, we could be in serious trouble here because it was a word which... I mean, it wasn't one of the normal words. <laughs> and um, anyway... The, a proper the, journalist would say, how many letters? Seven. Oh, all right, then. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it no, was. No, 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 I can... Um, and anyway, the, there was nothing that came of it, but that could have been... I mean, I, I'm very much against the Ofcom lists. I think mm. some of the words are just ridiculous. Mm. And I mean, I, my producer dumped me not that long ago, actually, for saying the word bitching. But what? in the context of he was bitching about her. Apparently, bitch is now a, a prescribed word with Ofcom. Oh. But I mean, Why? If, you, if, if I was calling a caller a bitch, fine, dump me. But I was just using it in the sort of argumentative sort of sense of the word. And I said, don't, that's ridiculous. Producers are always so conservative on these things. Do Ofcom ever listen to Radio 1 or any of the pop stations with <laughs> those not. insufferable lyrics? <laughs> well, quite. <laughs> I mean, I think you've got to kind of get with the age. And yeah. I, I think if you're a speech station, it's generally not five-year-old children that are listening. OK, it might be mum's having it on in the car when they're picking children up from mm. school. I get that, but the mm. presenter at that time of day takes that into account. Um, but I think if you're on in the evening... Why, why is bitch offensive? Is it not gender neutral? I think it's just sort of considered a, a derogatory word about women, so therefore okay. you can't use it. Oh, God, I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a, about local radio a bit, yeah. because you started... I mean, you were at Radio City, which is still, um, I think, considered one of the premier local radio stations. Massive so. audience yeah. still. Um, how has it developed? I, I mean, you just, I sometimes listen to BBC local stations and I kind of think they haven't developed at all. Oh, uh, that's, that's one of the things that makes me crossest about the BBC. 
um, they were first with local radio stations. And the local radio stations were very, very strong. Uh, certainly the ones I knew, Manchester, Liverpool, mm. Newcastle, very, very strong. Uh, and over the years, they've forgotten about them. Uh, oh, nobody owns them. Uh, put them away, you know, they're so embarrassing. Uh, and when they began, they were autonomous. And gradually, uh, as they belonged to news, the autonomy went and they became part of the greater whole. And therefore, you know, whenever, whenever there was a, 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 a cut to be made, they were cut and cut and cut. And it's a terrible mistake because local journalism has suffered enormously from the slow death by a million BBC mm. cuts of the local services. And I listen uh, to Radio London. I li when I'm in Liverpool, I listen to um, uh, Radio Merseyside. And I think of what they once were. Never Radio London, actually, because that was always trouble. Radio London has never it's been... always trouble. It, and yet they had the same guy running it for like 20 years. And you think, yeah. well, why? Yeah. And it's, you know, it should be. But actually... Uh, in Liverpool, there was a lot of resistance to the uh, Liverpool having Radio Merseyside, and it was called that deliberately because both sides of the river. Now, if you if you're from uh, uh, the the North Bank, as I am, you know, um, we are Liverpoolians. The other side are from the Wirral. Mm. Uh, we're from Birkenhead, and then not necessarily <laughs> Birk Birkenhead is no, not that's posh. True. That is Birkenhead true. is not posh. <laughs> but no, 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 it's where I'm from actually. Um, I'm from Liverpool Eleven, uh, uh, not from Bootle, whereas my grandmother used to say the bugs wear clogs. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm from Norris Green, which is in its own day notorious and is notorious to this day. But um, it's you know. The premise of these individual villages brought together with a common voice worked at the start. I never thought it would, and it did. It worked in Manchester, it worked in Derby, it worked mm. in Birmingham, it, and it worked in Liverpool. And gradually, as the journalism has faltered and failed and been cut, not faltered and failed because there occasionally comes out of one of the stations something ma magnificent. Um, you know, there have been programmes about the Liverpool Blitz, which have really torn the heartstrings. But by and large, the BBC made a terrible mistake, terrible mistake. And when the new woman took over a couple of years ago, I really welcomed her advent because she, she had a, a job she was very pleased in, uh, to be in, and was hoping to be creative. And I think she's got squashed under the avalanche of bureaucracy. You've got to be tough to work at the BBC. I couldn't work there. Mm. I'm too much of a rebel. Yeah, I, I think people always used to say to me, oh, you must want to be on Radio 4 or Radio 5. Uh, and at the beginning, I probably would have, I mean, I shouldn't say this probably, but I mean, 5 Live was the station that I would always listen to. Yeah. And sort of before I got into radio, and I, I used to do, do you remember Sunday service on yeah. Firefly? I used to do that when yeah. Andrew Pierce was off. And that, I thought, oh, somebody's going to spot me now, but they didn't. Um, but I know that I couldn't do what I do on LBC, on the BBC. I wouldn't have the freedom to do it. I would, we, we can get decisions very quickly. There isn't, a layer, there isn't five layers of management that you have to go through. If we have a programme idea, we either just go ahead and do it anyway, or we've got one person that we need to talk to about yeah. it. That's it. And I don't want a script. I don't want a list of questions from producers who feel that they run the programme rather than that you do. Um, and most people imagine that I'm sort of not telling the truth when I say, well... I have the freedom here, so I, I, I can't imagine going anywhere else. Um, well, you can't it, beat it. That small management, uh, st smaller management structure where what you say, what you feel, what you believe in communicates directly with yeah. management instead of going through 14 layers and 16 meetings. And you can feel it. And big changes are on the I way. Mean, can you imagine? They're, cutting, they're making savage cuts in yeah. news at the BBC. But... You remember when Denise Headley um, yes. first reared her head at LBC? Uh, I think you were listening when listening. she called in. Can you imagine if that had been a BBC programme, how long it would have taken to decide, OK, well, should, should we sort of have her on 
maybe in a couple of months' time, give her a chance. Well, we made we made that decision straight after the programme. Yeah, yeah. And I think I wrote. I said, I yeah. wonder when they'll give her a... Yeah. <laughs> and lo and behold, yeah. she was on. Um, and it, it, it's just great to be able to do that sort of thing. Yeah. And OK, there, there can be frustrations when it, at the BBC, you literally, although they say that oh, they haven't got any money, but if they want to put on a big event, they will go and put on a big event. Now, that's much more difficult for mm. us to do because we, we don't have the resources that, that they have, but I think we generally do OK. Well, it's interesting, this, this um, coming storm, because uh, there was a big reshuffle of news uh, just before the new Director General came in, and decisions that were made then are being carried through now. And they involve a lot of cuts to BBC News, to personnel. Mm. And a lot of things like the long-form considered programmes about, you know, hypothetically speaking, whether the, the NHS or uh, what happened at so-and-so. Those programmes where you, a lot of work has gone in, um, a lot of serious research, a lot of consideration of the script, and you come out of listening to it, feeling enriched. I mean, that's why I paid my licence fee for. There aren't going to be as many as the, mm. of those. Well, you look at Michael Cockrell's documentaries yeah. that he used to do. Where are yeah. they now? Yeah. And I mean, the BBC, they occasionally do an absolutely brilliant documentary series. They did one on Trump recently, a three-parter. I was thinking, why aren't you doing more of this sort of thing? But it's like long-form interviews. They've kind of given up on those. And that must be the cheapest form of television, you would have thought. Um, but they don't seem to happen so much now. Well... Well, not on, not on screen. You'll get... This is where podcasts come in, don't they? And the podcasts have kind of rejuvenated the long-form interview. Well, podcasts are part of the great audio boom. And podcasts have come about because, of, as you said before, about digital communication, which is really opened new fields, mm. it's open gates and yeah. here we are in the sunny uplands um, I I have a thing about podcasts um, uh, I think one, there are far too many, how do you make a choice? Don't tell me listen to yours because, you know, I can see that written over your head, but um, I only have six <laughs> Just the six Just the, <laughs> Just six. the six But it's it, it, there's so many to choose from. When I first went to the Sunday Times, they said, will you do podcasts as well? And I said, well, yeah, it's going to be difficult to do all that and, and have all of radio to cover and do it conscientiously. And they said, well, just do one. And I said, well, you know, it's it, so do one every week. And I you know, looked around and it was more trouble yeah. to find one to write about because it's just so much to choose from. So quite rightly, they, they went and did much more and they're doing much more now uh, but in a separate place because I think the thing about radio is that it's live um, you know even recorded programs come out as part mm. of a live transmission the thing about podcasts is it's canned now I quite like canned pineapple I quite often prefer it to real pineapple but they're two different things and I think you have a different set of judgments about podcasts and you have to have great patience to find the ones that you really, really like. I think that that is absolutely true. But I sometimes wonder whether podcasts can nowadays be a gateway to radio for a younger audience or whether they are gradually leeching listeners away from radio. And I find, to be completely honest, I've, if I, driving here today... I was listening to a podcast on my uh, car in, in my car. Yeah. I wasn't listening to live radio, and yeah. I find that is happening increasingly because yes. I can choose what I want to listen to. I don't have to have the roulette of thinking, well, if I'm driving at a particular time, do I want to listen to that presenter? Do I, do I want, want politics, or do, do I want to go to my football podcast? For yes, example? yeah, you have outlined the dilemma beautifully, actually, because I know that I would just listen to everything I like yeah. all the time instead of listening to things that I think, oh, I can't stand that Ian Dale. Oh, why did he say that? Or, you know, I, I can't... I think... I think there is that real danger. And all those people you see on the tube with the things in their ears, not listening to anything around them, which is often quite interesting. Mm. Um, they, they're just listening to 
somebody else's piece of art on their ears, I think they're missing something. But, I mean, who am I to complain? Or stand... I, you know, I don't want to be um, uh, standing in the way of progress. But it's a great thing for independent production companies, isn't it? Because I think their work was drying up from the, from the big radio groups and the BBC. But yeah. now they can put all their talents into podcasts. But... Do you think some of them make a mistake where they're, they're actually producing radio programmes for podcasts? Yes. Whereas, I mean, a podcast, I it's think, ought world. to be a different thing. Mm, I agree. And often it isn't. And yeah. you, you, you've got... Um, well, Nikki Campbell does a really brilliant podcast on dogs. It's called One of the Family. But it's got all sorts of radio bits in it. And I'm thinking, no, you don't need all of that. It's got like a, a sort of news jingle. And then it, 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 I think podcasts sometimes can be overproduced. Um, yes, uh, I've heard uh, I've heard quite a few podcasts where um, the rough edge of it mm. is actually the charming thing because it's not what you get on the radio. Yeah. It's not a piece of beautiful audio, honed and given the right background music and the the right number of pauses. It's something quite rough and rude. Um, not at all canned pineapple. <laughs> it, I like that analogy, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, good, good. But it, it's also, it gives you the freedom. Like this podcast that I do, I mean, generally the people that I interview are either vaguely well-known or very well-known, but occasionally I put in somebody that nobody's ever heard of. Mm. And, you know, those podcasts are often the most popular ones. I, I did one the other day with a guy called Nigel Khan, who is a fellow West Ham supporter. I got to know him through sort of writing a, a vlog. And he grew up in the East End of London and mm. just had just the most amazingly interesting life. So I said, well, Nigel, do you want to come and do the podcast? Two and a quarter hours it was. Wow. And it was quite... Parts of it were quite emotional. I mean, it's sort of... I was going to ask you a lot about your family background, but I listened to your Desert Island, Desert Island Disc, and you kind of covered it all on that, so I thought, well, I'm not going to concentrate on that here. But we did with him. And even people who hadn't got the slightest interest in football or, mm. or anything like that, they were just entranced by this guy's story. Mm. And... I think podcasts give you the opportunity to do that, which you can't You can't do that on the radio. You can't have someone on for two hours. It just doesn't work. I was, into my mind came John Drummond, um, erstwhile head of Radio 3, um, a, a very dominant kind of man, uh, who insisted on interviewing Isaiah Berlin at length. And everyone was... Phew. Quite. Nobody listened to that. He's only doing it because he's the controller of radio. <laughs> and they were spellbinding. They were spellbinding. But how often do you get a really good talker who is prepared to bear their inmost yeah. soul or a, a, a really um, historic thinker who can express the layers of argument that go into any particular concept? It, it's not often. But when you do... You do want to listen to quite, quite a long you time. You do, but you can't go to a station controller and say, I can't think of anybody, unless they're like the Queen or the Pope, where a radio station controller is going to say, yeah, you go ahead and interview that person for two hours. It just yeah. isn't going to happen. I did, not that long ago, I interviewed a guy who had been a city trader who went to fight against ISIS in Syria. I'm trying to remember his name. I can't. Um, and we were supposed to have him on for the hour and he was going to take calls. Um, and he was just spellbinding. So I took that over another 15 minutes. Yeah. But that's about the most I've ever done yes. on, on live radio. And that was just an instant decision. Just said to the producer in the break, let's do it, because we we're only going to do a phone in on something sort of from the day's news. Uh, and that can work, but you're never going to persuade someone to let you have two hours to do one person. How do you decide the editorial content of your programmes? Is there a general editorial meeting in the morning? Uh, at LBC and somebody takes a decision that certain topics will be pursued serially through all the shows? No, I think some people think that's what happens, but it, it actually doesn't. Each show is more or less completely independent. Really? I mean, there, there are planning meetings, and so you, you sort of get information about what's coming up next week. But my show... Um, 
I mean, we have the news hour, which I generally leave to the producers to do entirely. And they they might sort of, I might see the rundown and think, well, do we really need to do that? That isn't very interesting, is it? Let's do something else. Mm. But generally, they'll put that together. But the phone-ins is decided on the day. Mm. And I, I'm not a great fan of repeating phone-ins that have happened during the day, but sometimes there isn't anything else to cover. I mean, that, there's, mm. I mean, okay, the last couple of years, you've had, there's been a lot of news, and, and a lot of the time, it's fairly obvious what you, you're going to need to cover. But if if Sheila or Eddie have done a phone-in, I mean, say a COVID-related phone-in. Um, I will know that I've got to do a COVID-related phone-in because it is, I mean, generally the biggest news item yeah. though has been over the last year. But I'll try and think of a different question to ask. I don't want to do... I just don't want to repeat what other people have done. Now, sometimes you have to. Mm. But I also like to throw in rather challenging phone-ins, often emotional ones, mm. which I get much more enjoyment out of doing than a political phone-in nowadays. So where you, you're kind of challenging your listeners to tell you their stories on, on some very important issue to them. But you only need... You don't need hundreds of calls on a phone-in like that. You just need four or five for people telling their stories. Inevitably, they're not going to be two-minute stories either. And I did one the other day on what's it like being an illegal immigrant in this country. Mm. And I had a guy phone in, and he, I think he phoned in at half past. And he had come to this country as a 14-year-old from Afghanistan in 1999 on the back of a lorry from Calais. And he now runs a company employing 40 people. And I thought, well, that is such an interesting story. Yes. And I just let him go for half an hour. Yeah. Which is, again, very rare that you ever do that. But if you've got somebody who can talk and they're interesting, and, and you, you can almost hear people thinking, oh, I, I never knew that. So, so that's what happens if you can... How do you know he's real, though? Oh, you could just... T- you can tell. Can you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you, if you had... Um, I mean, I, I had various uncles who were very good at spinning a yarn. <laughs> they were around before phone into him. And I'm sure any of them could have kept you entertained with purely I... fictional sagas. Look, occasionally you get someone who abuses the privilege of coming on the show. That that inevitably will happen. Yeah. But I reckon that I've had... I have probably two prank callers a year... And, and you can always you can tell in the end that they are, and, and once or twice I've I've called them out. Um, it's very rare that you get somebody coming on maliciously. Mm. It has happened, but very rare. And you, the the producer or the person answering the phone, that's their job to root them out. Now inevitably, you will get one or two that slip through. Um, I remember, I mean, Nigel Farage used to have these sort of probably more regularly than than most. But he, he was actually quite good at dealing with them. Like speaking to like, I should think. I couldn't you possibly agree possibly with that. You cannot possibly agree. Looking back, and I mean, I said Steve Wright would be in my top three radio presenters. I mean, looking back over all the years that you've covered radio, who are the sort of three or four people that you think have had m- most impact on the radio sector? They might not even be presenters. Oh, impact on the radio sector. Um, gosh, you know, that's. I'll just leave that to simmer at the back of my mind. I mean, you know, I, I can think of voices that would make me stop and listen. I um, you know, there, Bill Hardcastle on the World at One, changed the face of news in this country. There was a huge battle which I didn't know about at the time. You know, on came the World at One. You just thought, blimey, yeah, that's amazing, because it was news done in a different way, mm. and there'd been this big fight within the BBC, only discovered years later, between news who wanted news and current affairs who wanted to do it as current affairs, two separate departments clashing. And Hardcastle, who wheezed and... So he was just before my time, I think. And he just gave this edge. It wasn't like a BBC voice. Yeah. It wasn't somebody calm, this is, this is the news and this is Alva Liddell reading it. It wasn't that at all. It was urgent. It was, and now we're going to bring you people who understand what this politician is really saying. So the world at one in the William Hardcastle days, definitely, definitely. Um, The most influential person in popular music in my life was Jack Jackson on a Saturday night, again before your time. I've never heard of him. Yeah, well, you should, you know, he's a legend. (laughs) Um, uh, I learned later that actually it was the producer or even the engineer who put the programme together. But I always thought, me and my brother, 
I would be 13, my brother would be 11. Used to, because it was like the height of sophistication, because it would start with trumpet blues and cantabile, um, Harry James, and then he, it was very jokey and cheery, and unlike anybody else on the live programme. And you come on, and he played Stan Kenton, Les Paul and Mary Ford. We had never heard these before. You know, they, they couldn't play much recorded music in those days because of um, agreements with the Musicians' Union. But this was the first of the record shows, and he was a DJ. And we were just enthralled by him. So he would be another one. And um, all of the presenters of Woman's Hour, because all of them, Marjorie and from... I can remember Marjorie Anderson. I met several of them uh, right through to Emma now, Emma Bonnet now. Uh, they're all women of their time who represent something, not always the things I represent or like or admire or wish to know about even on some occasions, but so they speak to the time. So all of the presenters on Women's Hour, there's still room for a Women's Hour. Not that I like it that much, and I don't like the extra 15 minutes on the end at the moment. <laughs> I'd, I wish it was less about texting and more about talking to people. But Emma is a considerable broadcaster, and I admire her beyond belief. And, you know, I, I listen to the world at one, and I think of Nick Clark. Mm. Uh, you know, what a voice, what yeah. a reporter. Absolutely. And, of course, Alistair Cook. You weren't an Alistair Cook fan. Uh, no, I well, you see, I've never really listened to Radio Four. I know this is a terrible admission. I, I I know who he is. I have listened to him, and obviously a massive, massive talent. But for some reason, Radio Four has never grabbed me. Mm. Mm. I, I think it's because I, Radio Five is my ideal station, news and sport. Mm. But since it's moved to Salford, I don't listen to it anymore. Don't you? No. I, the only, I listen to, if I'm in the car late at night, if Stephen Nolan's on, I'll listen to him because I, so think, do I. I think he's fantastic. So do I. He's one of, I mean, he probably has influenced me in the way that I do things more than anyone else on the radio. I've never met him. Well, I, I have met him and he's a great company. I've spoken to him. Um, he was going up the stairs at the Sony Awards and I was passing <laughs> by. Because he's got a good I, collection of those. And, and I <laughs> waved to him, and I'd just written something particularly disobliging about him. <laughs> and he, he turned around. We'd never met, but I just gave him a little wave, uh, thinking, oh, my knees can't get up those steps <laughs> more than once. And he said, you were right. You were right. And I thought, oh, one of these days I'll meet him and thank him. But I listened to him, and I, I listened to uh, Wake Up To Money. I love, you love Wake that, Up don't To you? Money. Because yes. you've written about it a lot. Yes, because it, it's the one place... I mean, I'm always up quite early, 5 o'clock-ish, you know, when it starts 5 o'clock, 5.15, thereabouts. And uh, if you want to know what small businesses are doing, yeah. what market traders are thinking, not, not market traders in the stock market, but people like market traders like I was and my mother was and my grandmother was, you know, in covered markets to other... UK, you you know what's selling, who's buying. It gives you a real feeling of the pulse. And uh, I, d I don't know if they value it enough. Sometimes well, I listen. I've, I've listened more to the programme that follows recently because um, I worry about Nicky Campbell. I think he's not being well produced. He talks too much. Um, but he, he's always hoiked out of trouble. <laughs> by um, the people he works with, with great grace. She Sheila Fogarty used to do it all the time. I know. But I, I think he is a consummate broadcaster. In, I mean, I, I have a lot of time for him, and I do, I do listen to him sometimes, but the rest of Five Live... What's I'm a consummate bro broadcaster doing? Stealing, you know, he, somebody else on the programme will take a, uh, a call or a, a link a subject and say somebody has said this and this and this. And he will take it over. He take, he's got this urge to conquer territory all the time. And I want to jump through the radio and shake him by the shoulders and tell him to stop it. I, maybe, but he's been doing it for a long time and has been very successful at it. No, it's, it's got worse. <laughs> It's definitely no, got worse. Know, next time I listen to him, I shall listen to him <laughs> with, with, with your ears. And who do you listen to on LBC? I listen to uh, LBC off and on, on all through the day. Uh, I listen to you. I listen to Sheila. 
uh, I listen to Eddie in the afternoon. I'm, I listen, if I'm feeling angry with the world, I listen to James O'Brien, but I find myself shouting at him more than even than I shout at Boris Johnson, which is quite a lot, really. He, he would take that as a major accolade. I, I know think. he would. So that's why I'm only telling you. I wouldn't dream <laughs> of saying it to him. <laughs> I remember the first time that I heard you say something about me and I was cut to the quick. You were, what did I say? You were on the media show. And I think it was when LBC went national. Oh, right. And the, whoever was presenting it said, so who do you listen to on LBC? And you said, James O'Brien, Nick Ferrari. And the presenter said, what about Ian Dale? And, and you said... <laughs> I can take him or leave him. He's got a bit of a whiny voice. And I, I because because I had come into radio comparatively late, and I was thinking, oh my God, have I? And I used to have, I don't know if you've ever come across Louise Burt, who, yes. she she was the deputy MD at um, Global. Not actually, it was before, before that. Um, and she said that I needed to sort of zhuzh up my voice a bit. And literally, before I would start a programme, this is when I was doing a Sunday morning show, it was sort of meant to sort of rival the political shows on the television, and she would literally scream at me through the glass just before we went on air, big bollocks! And that would sort of get me going, so yes. I'd say, you welcome to LB... Yes. And, but I, re I remember that, thinking, oh, she doesn't like me. And I took every presenter that I'm sure that you've ever said something like that about... Oh, really takes it to heart. But well, you've said some lovely things about me since. Oh, well, um, <laughs> you see, you, you, you only remember the leave. You didn't remember the take. Because obviously I'd listen to you. And, you, and especially when you're angry, your voice does go in, into the mm. whiny mode, you know. I know. And when you... All right, I'm looking over your shoulder. I'm your fairy godmother. <laughs> <laughs> That's over your shoulder. I know, we all need telling from time to time. But, you know, I've, I've been a broadcaster myself. I've done radio shows. I, uh, you know, I was a relief presenter on the Today programme for six weeks when they were doing the shift between going from London to the... Do you remember they split it with Manchester and uh, with Brian Redhead yeah. when he came into the programme? I did that... I did three days a week uh, for six weeks. And... You know, I've done Woman's Hour as a relief presenter and I've done Kaleidoscope, the arts programme and so on, and Critics Forum on Radio 3. I did Parkinson's programme on Radio 2. And, um, you know, I've done... Uh, and I know when somebody writes something about you, you tend not to see the cheery word. You mm. only see the horrid word. Well, we could go on for a couple of hours doing this. but we've, we've... Have we? No, we haven't. Oh. We've got to stop because right. in about 45 minutes, You're I've got air. to be on air and I'm not in the right studio. Oh. <laughs> so it's been an absolute pleasure, Gillian, talking to you. I hope we can do it again very soon. Oh, that would be lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And join us again for another All Talk next week.